Greetings denizens of YouTube. In this video no 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 don't hit the dislike button hang on let me explain myself. Oh shit. You already hit it didn't you? Anyways, in this video I will be explaining why the Monster vs Godzilla movies suck and are gay, and why the Heisei movies are better, and not made by Satan. Kong Skull Island sucks the least, because there wasn't certainly a split feeling in the community unlike with each Godzilla movie. The movie Godzilla 2014 had unanimous love in the beginning for being realistic, but also had a fall off in the months after the theatrical release. King of the Monsters had initial praise and backlash, and divided people right away in the same way people either saw Gareth Edwards as a savior or the worst thing to happen to Japan. And Godzilla vs Kong hit sort of a medium with the fan base where we all kind of recognize its flaws, while seeing it as potentially one of the most important Godzilla films ever made. It's safe to say my points are jumbled, but that being said, my points still stand. The first reason is screen time. This chart created by a Joker cluster fits all 30 plus movies, but it needs to be updated. It's clearly outdated. Regardless, as you can see, the first Godzilla movie on the far left clocks in at 8 minutes 44 seconds, and since the fan base regards that movie as a Japanese masterpiece, they agree it sets the gold standard for all other monster movies from that point onward. Truth be told, the first movie is not that good. In the future, I will explain why the sequel raids again is better. But for now, all the Heisei movies surpass the original in terms of screen time, though 8 minutes 44 seconds isn't that high of a bar to begin with. As for the Monsterverse movies, they also do, 2014 in particular clocking in at 9 minutes 56 seconds, but they don't really feel like it. One reviewer of 2014 put it best, when he said you know, Godzilla's pretty cool. Maybe they will make a movie about him sometime. That same reviewer also said you know, Julius Caesar's pretty cool. Maybe they will make a play about him sometime. Side note, on the far right you see Shin Godzilla clocking in at 17 minutes 23 seconds, but in the future I will explain why it sucks worse than the Monsterverse movies and Neon Genesis Evangelion itself. The second reason is the humans. Since every Godzilla movie has them occupy 90% of the screen time, most people don't think of them when going to see the movies, like most people don't think of plates when going to a restaurant for the food. In the Monsterverse, most of the human characters are gay and their gayness varies 2014 stars Brian Cranston, because he was in Breaking Bad. His wife dies in 1999, and he becomes the gayest man of 2014. Everyone thought he was going to fight Godzilla in a Jaeger powered by blue methamphetamine, but alas he doesn't. And he's killed off by the halfway mark. Ken Watanabe is not a main character, nor is he a funhouse mirror antagonist. Most of his actions consist of doing nothing, and letting nature take its course, when he should be driving the plot like wanting to capture Godzilla, and seeing the fullest extent of his power. He does get around to affecting the plot, in King of the Monsters, but alas he dies. In 2014, he's not so gay like Cranston, he has a superfluous assistant who calls him Sensei. He also carries a pocket watch dating back to the bombing of Hiroshima, but it doesn't tell time so what's the point. Cranston has a son named Ford. As a child he lived an odd life like Timothy Green. Everyone thought he was going to use his plant powers on Godzilla, but he doesn't. After a tragedy, he grows up to be straight, and he wants nothing to do with his father, but his wife urges him to go see him in Japan. When his father dies, he doesn't cry. I didn't cry, when I was 15 and neither did Spider-Man. But what holds Ford back is, that he is a rehash of Haruo Sakaki. For a movie that's supposed to be realistic, Ford keeps running into the monsters and this happens about 4 times. What are the odds of that happening? He is a soldier, but his speciality is defusing bombs, so why does he need a gun? Don't know. Ford's wife is played by the only Arlson sister who can act, but her character is a blonde and therefore stupid. Their son watches Godzilla on TV and calls him a dinosaur for no reason. Unfortunately she doesn't die, violating the rule of natural selection. King of the Monsters introduces a new batch of characters equipped with their own gayness. 
Kyle Chandler was in Peter Jackson's King Kong and now he's in a Godzilla movie. His character seems to be a closet furry. Evidence for this are as follows. He watches a home video where he and his children dress up as bears, and they dogpile Emma for not putting on her fursona. His son Andrew is killed in 2014 and that sends the Russells down a spiral to divorce. Emma took Madison, and Mark has no one to share his fursona with. In 2019, we see him taking candid photos of little wolf boys which suggests he's still a furry. In Antarctica he hits his back on a container, but he isn't paralyzed. He should at least be having a cane and limping. People like to think he represents people who lost faith in God after a tragedy, but Mark can't decide on being a non-believer or someone who isn't sure about the existence of the supernatural, but by the end of the movie, he believes in Godzilla. Though his faith is shaky again in GVK. Charles Dance was in Game of Thrones and plays an eco-terrorist. His character Alan Jonah is in fact an apex homosexual. He has no children of his own, and his methods are domineering. But if he's supposed to be a terrorist, he should at least wear a turban with his turtleneck sweater, and he should be a Muslim, and have a sword to boot. His best line is we don't have time for this. King of the Monsters is also known for being the first Godzilla movie to pass the Bechdel test. A measure of representation of women by womanizer Alison Bechdel. So not only do you get to watch monsters and monster fights, you get to look at women. The Heisei movies establish a woman's sexuality by the length of her hair with Miki Segusa being a lesbian. Miki was the only lesbian in the Heisei movies, but most women in the Monsterverse movies are lesbians with various degrees. Vivienne Graham was the only woman in King of the Monsters with long hair which is why she dies. This makes her irrelevant in two-fourths of the movies, and establishes a heterophobic precedence. Graham is also said to be Sarah Zor's apprentice, but he doesn't call her Kohai which means student. Just like her role in Paddington, she is superfluous. King of the Monsters is women are not only diverse in lesbianity, but also by race. Emma Russell is a depressed hysterical lesbian mother, and it also doesn't help that Vera Farmiga herself looks like a middle-aged lesbian. Depressed because her son dies during the events of 2014 turning her into a lesbian, and her making sense of her son's death sends her down the rabbit hole of hysteria which is how she joins up with Alan Jonah and his fellow eco-terrorists. Emma's hysteria and environmental extremism can explain why King of the Monsters got negative reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Despite having the blood of millions on her hands, she decides to give up her lesbianity and sacrifices herself to keep her daughter safe. Millie Bobby Brown was Eleven in Stranger Things which is why she's in King of the Monsters. She's also in Godzilla vs. Kong, and becomes Godzilla's advocate, so she's like Miki Segusa in that regard, except Miki gave Godzilla a lobotomy that one time. Madison and Miki are bisexual which is still lesbian, but Madison takes the best of both her mother and father's ideas on dealing with the monsters. For a while, she stops the Titan uprising with the Orca box with the press of a button which upset it autistic people watching these movies to watch Titanic battles. Little do they know that Millie herself is deaf in one ear. Dr. Eileen Chen is one of the two iteration of the Mothra twins in the Monsterverse. Despite being a twin, she has a straight sister. But she cannot decide on being Japanese or Chinese. Since she is portrayed by Zhang Ziyi, she is therefore Chinese which means she has thunderous thighs like Chun-Li from Street Fighters. Young cynics call her a wise Japanese girl which is racist. Colonel Diane Foster is black, she is bald like Wakanda's women, which thankfully makes her not like Leslie Jones. Ghostbusting 2016 was a travesty. Godzilla vs. Kong also introduces new characters. Many fans agree that Gia was the best character in that movie. She's deaf and mute, but she has seismic hearing like Toph. She is also the last of a civilization which died off, so why do people insist on calling her Iwi? The moment she dies, the Iwis are extinct. Her role in GVK is to be Kong's love interest, but unlike Kong's past love interests, he doesn't die defending her. Nathan fills the role Ford and Mark filled, but he's not Nathan Drake. He is motivated by a dead brother of his, and when we are introduced to him, he is a fraternity boy embracing his inner frat boy. 
Eileen specializes in talking to monkeys, but she can't talk to Khan. She is supposed to be Gia's adoptive mother, and communicates with her through sign language, but whatever happened to Gia's actual mother? Don't know. Bernie is a racist stereotype. He is the funny black guy we see in movies, because black people are supposed to be funny according to racist Hollywood. He is red pilled a K a right wing and a believer in the alt right, even though black people on mass are left wing, which explains why democratic cities get reduced to rubble. His role is to be a conspiracy theorist like Jesuit coadjutor Alex Jones. He brainwashes Madison after all the trauma she's been through, in King of the Monsters. And he carries a flask containing alcohol in a gun holster in memory of his dead wife. Good to know that Hollywood thinks black men like getting drunk, so they can rock and roll. Josh Valentine is agreed to be the most useless character in the movie. He accompanies Madison on her case to prove Godzilla's innocence, but she likes to rip on him which autistic introverts think of as toxic behavior. But whenever they are not on screen, Josh becomes Madison's sex slave. She ball gags and whips him for misbehaving. Ren Sarazora is often criticized for not showing any contempt for his father, even though he should have daddy issues. This makes him a ripoff of Kylo Ren, Shinji Akari, and Zuko. On top of that, who is his mom? Is he actually dead? Is he gay? He does have an earring and one ear, but he gets groomed. The third reason these movies suck is the kaiju themselves. First is Godzilla. If you look at Japanese movies and TV shows, you will see that the Japanese are very creative when it comes to designing monsters. When Americans do it, they come off as incredibly generic. This Godzilla recycles the design of every other Godzilla a small amount of alterations to make it seem different, but the template is exactly the same. Even down to its body shape. He is worse than Tristar's 1998 Godzilla. He is fat. He has more lies and arms. His feet make no sense. He has gills. Gills for heaven's sake. He lacks political subtext, but what does make him an interesting version of Godzilla is that he embodies it a normativity despite the move as being gay. Take notes Blue Nova. This Godzilla is said to be the most realistic take on the character, but not really. Since the 1950s, depicting a fire-breathing organism is strange. This Godzilla doesn't care about humans, but he lets Serizawa boop his snoot before blowing up his home. Love or hate the Mutos, they are not exactly copies of the Cloverfield monster or the monster from Super 8 or the bugs from Starship Trooper, but they feel like it. Their color scheme is red and black which is cliche. Their role is to reproduce, but they get cock-blocked by Godzilla. Their electromagnetic pulse powers make no sense. Is it supposed to be a social commentary on our over-reliance on technology? Don't know. Kang is an interesting case in the monsterverse. First of all, who owns the rights to Kang? If it's universal, then they should sue Warner Brothers and Toho for copyright infringement. If not, then should he be in the public domain by now? The novelization of the 1933 movie is in the public domain, and it has a canonized fan fiction sequel. This iteration of Kang is unrealistic. He throws a propeller on a chain like Scorpion in Mortal Kombat, and he uses an axe like Kratos in the Norse Saga. The movies show him having strange taste. He eats people, calamari and fish and brains, but not fruit like an actual monkey. Since his defeat in GVK, a lot of black men came out showing their allegiance to Team Khan. Black men like Amazing Lucas were very salty calling the movie utter trash and a hate crime, and wanted to start a riot. Hashtag Khan Lives Matter. The skull crawlers are ripoffs of the Mutus, the spirit creatures from Princess Mononoke, and Cubone from Pokemon. They don't have legs. They are supposed to be cool, but they aren't. They eat everything that moves. Does this include eating their own selves? Don't know. Mothra is also an interesting case. Her theme in King of the Monsters is epic, and not as corny as the previous versions, but it's still not cool. In her larval form, she lets Madison boop her snoot, but she's supposed to have a connection with Eileen Chen and her straight sisterling. They are both portrayed by Zhang Ziyi, so there must be some Jack and Jill sorcery at play. 
This iteration of Mothra has a stinger like a bee which is a sword-like weapon, but she doesn't die when using it. Can Mothra be transgender? Despite the fact that she's supposed to be Godzilla's love interest? Don't know. Fake news reporter Daniel Menegas wrote in his retarded article why Crawl is a better reptile monster movie than Godzilla, King of the Monsters, that King of the Monsters features exactly zero dogs and tragically sacrifices Mothra Queen of the Monsters, the latter even prompted a series of tweets with the hashtag Mothra Innocent. And yes the hashtag does exist, I googled it. Ghidorah is a fan favorite kaiju, to this I say really? His theme in King of the Monsters is based on the Hard Sutra, a pagan Buddhist chant that means void. So it bears resemblance to the Ghidorah from the planet Eater and Zaheer from Legend of Korra who enters the void and flies away. Each head has a personality, aggressive, state-headed, and curious. And the third head's curiosity is what led him into become a meme named Kevin. He's cool but not really. There is a trope called Battle in the Rain, and this iteration of Ghidorah is that trope personified. Every scene he's in has a storm which either makes him an embodiment of chaos, and imposing or makes it harder for people to see the action, unless they wear glasses. This trope also makes him like Kyogre from Pokemon, and this in turn, makes Godzilla like Groudon. Then who's Rayquaza? Don't know. Is this iteration of Ghidorah supposed to be a social commentary on global warming slash cooling, and or climate change? Don't know. Rodan is KOTM director Michael Dougherty's favorite kaiju, though his theme is nothing special. He is characterized as a big Mexican fire chicken with lava blood. When he falls into the water, why doesn't he turn to rock, don't know. Michael Dougherty gave his personal headcanon that this Rodan is the offspring of the two Rodans from the 1956 film, but that makes no sense, since they are not in the same continuity. Is this Rodan supposed to be a social commentary on illegal immigrants? Rodan's introduction has him wanting to eat Mexicans, and chasing the Argo carrying Mexicans into the United States, so he must be a symbol of ICE or Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Donald Trump? Don't know. Interestingly enough the pilot who jettisons himself into Rodan's mouth is played by Michael Dougherty, who looks Mexican himself. Mecha Godzilla is what sealed the deal, in making the monster verse not so realistic. He is wirelessly powered by Hollow Earth energy. Disrupting his power supply momentarily is Josh's only active part in the story. This iteration of Mecha Godzilla is better than City on the Edge of Battle's Mecha Godzilla, but is still not cool, because it's legendary and not Toho. Mecha Godzilla is white and red compared to Godzilla who is black and blue. Is there a racist undertone to this? Don't know. People thought Pacific Rim was going to be part of the Monsterverse, but that didn't happen. Regardless, Mecha Godzilla rehashes the Jaegers from Pacific Rim and the Evers from Evangelion. Mecha Godzilla's inclusion in GVK causes Godzilla and Kong to team up. It's better than the snooze train wreck known as Batman v Superman, but it still sucks according to the faggots from Scope and their retarded return of the movie review and discussion on GVK. Like really, what kind of retard says Kong has formed an unlikely bond with a native girl who's deaf, it's a dynamic that's weird, but feels tired and used. There are 17, and counting kaiju in the monsterverse, but so far we've seen about 4 of them. Additional information on them is found in third party material, which is non-canon, and can be decanonized in a split second. These monsters aren't that creative. Scylla is just a giant enemy spider. Behemoth looks like a mammoth from Ice Age. Methuselah is literally a mountain and not Anguirus, and Warbat doesn't look like a bat, and is just Buraki from D-War. The strange thing is these monsters are loved by fans despite not having enough screen time to be considered characters. The fourth reason these movies suck is the Hollow Earth. It's not realistic. It's a cool idea but it just isn't. It's not mentioned in 2014. It's too much to head canon, in order to make sense in universe and it plagiarizes Edgar Rice Burroughs and Jill Verne's work. Pellucida and Journey to the Center of the Earth invented the Hollow Earth concept. It also plagiarizes the scrapped sequel to Raids Again. 
In Bride of Godzilla, there was supposed to be a hollow earth consisting of Godzilla's, Angua users, Rodans, Verans, and Little Mermaids. It gets blown up when Godzilla takes a giant robot that looks like a woman back to the hollow earth, and it has a bomb in it which detonates. The fifth reason is the directors themselves 2014's director Gareth Edwards is a chubby Brit. His only work as an indie director is Monsters, which sucks. His uphill task was supposedly to do better than TriStar, but when you really think about it, when Gareth took the helm of director and had creative control, the first thing that he did was make Godzilla upright, changing the dorsal plates, changing the tail, changing the claws. And he did these things and the fans cheered, but he did these things as if they were so obvious to do, as if he was almost in a way insulting Roland Emmerich's intelligence. Like you were not that smart to make these simple changes to Godzilla, without realizing he just he actually just missed the point. People also claim Gareth took the realistic approach to Godzilla, but 2014 wasn't so natural or realistic. Ford was just lucky. Gareth claims to be a fan of anime and Godzilla, and wanted to emulate films of the past where you don't always get to see the monsters like Jaws or Alien, but he chose to cut away from the monsters. Bad directing. This directing choice is what started the whole screen time craze we now see in movie discussions, and it also started the just here for Godzilla wars, bringing out the inner autism within the Godzilla fanbase. After 2014, he went on to direct the best Disney Star Wars film Rogue One, only then to appear in another chubby Brits movie, that being Ryan Johnson's Star Wars The Last Jedi, the second worst Disney Star Wars film. The first worst being JJ's Rise of the Skywalker. King of the Monsters director Michael Dougherty is a Hispanic German, he is a Mexican Nazi and the worst thing since Adolf Hitler. His only work as an indie director is Krampus which includes a jack-in-the-box eating little girls. No wonder Vivienne was eaten by Ghidorah. In an interview with Collider, he commended Gareth for his slow burn approach to 2014, praising him for teasing the crowd. So in King of the Monsters, he showed more Godzilla and monsters, but continued teasing the autistic just here for Godzilla keyboard warriors. With King of the Monsters' release, these autists not only obsessed over screen time, but now ask the question who the hell watches a Godzilla movie for the plot or characters, when the point is obviously the monsters. These retards obviously haven't seen Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla who has the best female protagonist. Doherty is praised by most Godzilla fans for carrying the film, but panned by some for putting himself as a fan before the film, and it shows in the Rotten Tomatoes score. His mother even helped out with the movie, she provided flamingo sounds for Odan. Godzilla vs. Khan director Adam Wingard was inspired by Michael Bay's Transformers, that's a huge red flag. His only work as an indie director was Nonsflix's Death Note. Other than Demand 1954, everyone agrees that it sucks. Adam Wingard seems also inspired by Anno's Evangelion. He has a fight on aircraft carriers, a pyramid-shaped headquarters, a boy with daddy issues getting in a damn robot and so on. Adam also looks like a viking, more so than Kong Skull Island director Jordan Vogt Roberts with his $5 foot long beard. In conclusion, I leave you this quote from James Ralph, a Polish film junkie. Anyone can make their own sparkling wine and call it champagne, but champagne just ain't champagne if it's not from Champagne, France. Even though rotten sparking wine can come from Champagne, France. Case in point, Shin Godzilla is rotten, and I will explain later why it sucks worse than the Monsterverse. Until then, good night. Shalom people of YouTube. Before the video starts I want to address something, what I want to talk about real quick is you, you the people watching this video right now. Sigh. I don't want to make this video, because you people claim Gojira, the so-called original Japanese masterpiece, is the best Godzilla movie ever made, and the tried and true formula to making monster movies. However, now the dust has settled, since the 1950s, a real comparison between Godzilla 1954 and Godzilla Raids again can come out. The title of this video alone tells you everything you need to know about this video, whether you're going to agree with me, or disagree with me. 
You'll probably tell me that I'm the worst Godzilla YouTuber there is, that I should delete my content and jump off a bridge, that I only do it for the views and controversy, and hey, you know honestly that's all fair, but guess what, you still clicked on it. Nobody's forcing you to watch this. I just see people get so triggered in this fan base and the funny part is that it's the adults who are acting like children. I had to dislike this video because Godzilla, 1954, is my favorite because it was the first Godzilla movie to ever be made. I hate your videos forever plus your videos are garbage. Go live in hell with the other bad people. I hate you, British boy. I hate you and your videos still you piece of shit. I hate your videos. British boy, I hate this video, you are the worst YouTuber ever and you deserve no subscribers, Godzilla, 1954, is the best Godzilla movie ever made, go away if you're gonna ruin the fun, er mom, Godzilla Raids Again is by far the worst movie of 1955. But what do you expect from people who take out mortgages just to afford plastic toys? So in this video, I will explain why the film Godzilla Raids Again, or as it's colloquially called Gigantis the Fire Monster, is better than the first Godzilla movie. And how it improves the monster movie formula. Also, happy Godzilla Day you nutty kids. November 3rd. The first reason why Raids Again is better is the kaiju. In the first movie, Godzilla was called Shodai Goji, and in Raids Again he's called Gyakshu Goji. As you can see, Gyakshu Goji's puppet and suit are more anatomically consistent than Shodai Goji's. Gyakshu Goji provides innovation, in that it has movable eyes which gives the sense that Godzilla is a sentient creature. Since Shodai Goji died by suffocation and disintegrated, Gyakshu Goji is the one Godzilla we follow in this film, and for the rest of the Showa film series. This is also the starting point for Godzilla's character development from public menace to folk hero over the span of 20 years. Godzilla isn't the only kaiju in the film, he is locked in battle with Anguirus. Other than Redosaurus, Anguirus is the first quadruped kaiju. He may look like a spiky Anglosaurus, but he has special abilities. He has high endurance, he can take Godzilla's atomic breath head on. He has a spiky carapace which he can curl up into a ball and roll like Sonic the Hedgehog. He has ultrasonic roars which would be later incorporated into the Atari games. Even though this ability was scrapped, Anguirus would have been able to fire incandescent light breath like Godzilla, making him by definition a fire monster. Anguirus has one weakness and that's no neck protection, which Godzilla uses to his advantage. This vulnerability makes Anguirus relate a bowl which, in turn sets the stakes. The second reason is the human characters. The 1954 movie's characters make you want to feel sorry for them, but that doesn't work. Most of the humans have an attribute that everyone isn't going to identify with, except for Ogata. He's nothing special, he's an average Joe who works on boats and has a girlfriend named Demiko, and he is played by Akira Takorada. Sarah Zora is the scientist who doesn't hang around. He has an eye patch, but he is not a pirate. Emiko is the daughter of a famous scientist, but she's a helpless romantic who screams and needs rescuing. She runs up a hill in slacks which is stupid, and she has an extravagant wardrobe. She has like five or more outfits in the movie and many many hats that you can swear she changed outfits off screen in between shots. There is a love triangle between these three. This movie feels like a ripoff of Twilight. Emmy Koss' father Dr. Yamorni is an old line dispenser, and is a ripoff of Oppenheimer. Shinkichi is just a poor boy from a poor family, like Disney's is a lord in. The only thing special about him is, that he gets housebroken, because Godzilla bulldozed his house with his family inside, truly nothing special, this trope is so overdone, spare him his life from this monstrosity. Here's a lesson the first movie can take from Raids again. Make your characters average Joes, that way they are more relatable to the audience, and don't come off as Mary Sue's. Shoichi Sukiyo and Koji Kobayashi are chums, and partners at work. They are middle class workers trying to make a living, but they work together to stop Godzilla. They are comrades in arms. Hidemi Yamaji is an average middle class woman, and is Sukiyo Ka's supportive girlfriend. Kohei Yamaji is Hidemi rich and supportive daddy, and is the president of Sukiyo Ka and Kobayashi's fishing company. 
Best of all, he finds them work to do in economic hardships caused by the monsters. Dr. Yamorni comes back, but his account is consistent with the past movie and his little screen time makes him more of a prop than a distraction. The three stooges in the film may cause a plot contrivance, but their part is minuscule and can be removed from the film with nothing of value would be lost. Third reason is Raids again has better writing and production value. The story has dire stakes, the stakes are there as opposed to feeling like they're there. There are no more oxygen destroyers, since Serizawa killed himself, rather than make more. Japan and the rest of the world is at the mercy of Godzilla or any other monster. So literally every death that happens after the first movie by the monsters is Serizawa's fault. He would rather die than fight. As if it wasn't bad enough, his oxygen destroyer killed all the fish in Tokyo Bay and made it barely habitable. Therefore, Shoichi Sukioka and Koji Kobayashi have to find fish somewhere else. This piece in continuity is consistent with the previous movie for better or worse. To compensate for the lack of oxygen destroyers, our hero's best effort to protect Japan is to draw Godzilla away with lights. If Raids again was to have a monster fight, then the suit would have to be lightweighted. Shodai Goji's suit weighed over 200 pounds, and it was as hot as the furnace of hell to be in there. Heruo Nakajima and Toho may have worked hard to bring Godzilla to life, but they didn't work smart. Raids again had Gyakushu Goji and Anguirus's suits lightweighted, which resulted in lower chances of the actors inside getting heat exhaustion. The suits being lightweighted allowed for the fights to be animalistic and realistic, which added value to the entertainment. Even though somebody cranked up the speed of the camera when filming the fights, the results were still unintendedly animalistic, because animals are fast. By raids again existing, the definitiveness of the 1954 movie's ending is retconned. Dr. Yamorni stated that as long as humanity keeps to atomic tests, another Godzilla would appear, but the movie ended. Raids again retcons the ending and continues the story, making it no longer a standalone movie. Tonally, Raids again emphasizes keeping your chin up and moving on from tragedy. This is a type of film that tells you life won't go your way, but you've got to carry on. Average people carrying on, keeping their positive attitude and working together to fight an existential threat will always be happier and better than the doom and gloom and corniness of the original movie. The first Godzilla's production was a cluttered mess. Pretentious internet scholars like Up From The Depths consider AIDS again to be the antithesis of its predecessor. One was made from the heart, while the other was made for money, but anyone can have a passion for their work, and it can still come out like ass. The script went through too many drafts and revisions, and as a result, interesting ideas were left out. In the movie, we are told that Godzilla is carnivorous, but we don't get to see him eating people or animals. In an early draft, Godzilla was supposed to attack a cargo ship full of safari animals, and he would eat them like Shirley Temple eating animal crackers in her soup. Previous drafts had Dr. Yamorni be a crazy scientist and Godzilla supposed to look creepier like a dragon you see on Japanese artwork. Emi Kondo Gotta was supposed to ride a chopper and throw a bouquet of flowers into the sea for Serizawa at the end, which would have been compelling. But we are given less compelling send off for Serizawa at the end of the movie. Scenes were filmed, but so much of it was scrapped and put on the cutting room floor. There were scenes where Shinkichi buries his family and Yamorni adopts him. It was scrapped, and we are told he was adopted, which is lazy. There was a scene with Emi Ko and Serizawa as teenagers which would have made their relationship less one note, but alas it was scrapped. Emi Ko and Ogata had a scene where they spend time on the beach and they see Godzilla's tail, but it was scrapped. And most offensive cut of all, Godzilla was shot, having a cow in his grasp and eating it, but it was scrapped. The director didn't like portraying Godzilla this carnivorous, because he was a hack. And there are too many technical errors that it's hard to call this a film. Notice how I have always referred to Raids again as a film. I have never referred to Godzilla 1954 in this video as a film, it's a movie. Martin Scorsese may be retarded in what's cinematic, but Godzilla 1954 is not a film. There are jump cuts in which a shot is broken into two parts. 
I even counted how many times it shows Godzilla, and it cuts away to the humans 80 times. Pathetic. The movie is presented in 4 by 3 aspect ratio which is supposedly artistic, but it's pretentious and lazy. And it's too grainy the film reel is littered with dust and particles and stuff and you can't see what's projected on screen. On the contrary, Raids Again is a simple yet tidy film. As far as I know, nothing was left on the cutting room floor, so what you see, is what you get. Wink. Director Motoyoshi Oda lived by an old say get it out by Tuesday. And that he did. He created a film in just six months after the first movie which had to have been an achievement at the time. And it made sense, to capitalize on the success of the first movie. The fourth reason is the political subtext. Godzilla 1954 has an anti-nuclear agenda attached to it, but doesn't even try to hide it. It has the subtlety of a sledgehammer. It obviously spoon feeds the message, that nukes are bad, mk this is a problem, because there is no room for the audience, to come up with their own original interpretations. Even Ashiro Honda, director of Godzilla 1954, said once upon a time that reviews for Godzilla Raids again were more positive compared to the previous film, stating that it was considered stupid by the media for a director, to add ideas or themes into a science fiction film. He commented, that's why I think, that the first Godzilla was only considered a weird movie. That's probably why they liked the second movie much better. And he was right. Raids Again doesn't have a theme that splashes in your face. The 2021 film Godzilla vs Khan can amusingly be interpreted as a socialist movie. Likewise, Raids Again being open to interpretation, can allow it to be interpreted as a Cold War allegory. Godzilla can represent the United States and its racism towards Japanese people of the time. Anguirus can represent the Soviet Union and its Marxist ideology. Both Godzilla and Anguirus are draconic, they look like dragons, while also symbolizing draconic law and treatment of subjects be it lynching or genocide. In the film, Godzilla defeats Anguirus, which symbolically means, that capitalism will always triumph over communism, as long as a capitalist society doesn't fall for communism. If the United States were to try communism, people think it'll get it right this time, but psychiatrist Jordan Peterson thinks otherwise. The fifth and most important reason is the Showa era. The main draw of Kaiju Ego is seeing monsters rampaging through cities. King Kong and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms may have invented the genre, but what drew kids to Godzilla in the first place, was the promise of that incredible spectacle. Raids again puts Godzilla on ice as opposed to killing him. This subversion of expectations allowed Toho to experiment with new, and interesting monsters like Rodan, Mogira, Varan, Mothra, Barragon and Frankenstein. Cinematic Universe is what people these days call movies connected by continuity, but Toho did it before Marvel popularized the idea and DC pretended it. Then Toho decided to bring Godzilla back to the screen, but to keep him relevant, and for him to progress as a character, he needed to go from public menace to folk hero. Once Godzilla had become a beloved character like Winnie the Pooh, Toho accumulated everything they did in the 50s and 60s into the cut-rate grand finale known as Destroy All Monsters. It made millions at the local and worldwide box office. People were more excited for this monster mash than anything Marvel did with Thanos pre-Infinity War. Obviously more Godzilla movies were made up till 1975, but that goes to show just how powerful Godzilla was as a franchise. Unfortunately, Toho had to go and kill their golden goose. In 1984, with the release of Godzilla 84, they decanonized the entire Showa era except for the first movie 84 was a direct sequel to 54, ignoring everything in between. All of it was gone 20 years of Godzilla and Kaiju content thrown into the trash. Needless to say Godzilla fans didn't take this kindly and protested. Alas, their complaints fell on deaf ears. And there you have it. Five elements as to why Godzilla Raids Again is better than Godzilla 1954. Before I end this video, I'm opening the floor, to debate with Raids Again detractors. The biggest offender and worst person I'd love to debate the most would be Matt Burke from Monstrosities. His video on Raids Again was gay, calling it the worst Godzilla movie ever. 
he couldn't be any more retarded. That's all I have. You are all children, and you have run this franchise into the ground. Move on. Good night. Well, think again, sunshine. Hello, YouTubers. I watched Shin Godzilla in the theaters once, and once was enough to convince me that it was the gayest movie of 2016. When I heard Hideaki Ono directed both the Stumpster Fire and the classic Animania on Genesis Evangelion, I just had to make a comparison. So in this video, I will explain why Hideaki Ono's magnum opus known as Evangelion is better than Shin Godzilla, and why it blasts Shin out of the water. This may be my harshest video, but it has to be said. As always, this video contains spoilers for both Shin Godzilla and Evangelion, even though 2016 and 1995 were a long time ago. Unless you want to be spoiled, and or want your brain to catch fire and burn oh so coldly, go away. First we must know who Hideaki Ono is, and his role in the anime industry. Like George Lucas and Western spiritualism, Hideaki Ono found Japanese spiritualism to be closest to his personal beliefs, and is also a vegetarian. Ono wanted to create things, he founded anime studio Gainax, and after the war, Ono stayed secluded in a deep depression that seemed endless. But then his luck changed, when he took the helm of an all-original anime series, not based on a manga, that we now know as Neon Genesis Evangelion. While Onno channeled what he learned from clinical depression, he became disenchanted with the Japanese otaku lifestyle, so the show stands as a form of catharsis, and as an affront to the otaku power structure. It was meant to show why hedonistic escapism is not healthy and that accepting reality is how people can find peace and fulfillment. Not only that, Onno single-handedly revolutionized anime. People think Osor Mutezuka was the god of manga and anime for his works like Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion, but Onno and Evangelion carved a path for new anime content from 1995 onward. We have anime works like B Trains Noir, Dot Haxine, Gainax's Garen Lagan, Trigger's Kill La Kill, Attack on Titan, and so many more. Unfortunately, the audience that grew up in the 90s didn't catch Evangelion's memo. A true synthesis was never created, and the audiences composing of young Japanese men and otakus watched Evangelion for the mere escapism of it, and to masturbate to 14-year-old girls. They are disgusting creatures. Nothing was learned. Onno is said to be Hayao Miyazaki's apprentice, both as an anime director and manager of a bathhouse, and Miyazaki values his work highly. Miyazaki also opposes the otaku power structure, but he and Onno have become the very thing they swore to destroy. Miyazaki said once upon a time you see, whether you can draw like this or not, being able to think up this kind of design, it depends on whether or not you can say to yourself oh yeah, girls like this exist in real life. If you don't know it spend time watching real people you cannot do this, because yeah I have never seen it. Some people spend their lives interested only in themselves. Almost all Japanese animation is produced with hardly any basis taken from observing real people you know. It is produced by humans who cannot stand looking at other humans. And that is why the industry is full of otaku. Otakus who watched anime in the 90s are now creating anime with girls having big breasts and big eyes, and this in turn, inspires future otakus, it's a vicious cycle. Now look I'm sure Hideaki on no I'm sure he's a nice guy I know I'm ragging on him, but he just had no business directing Shin Godzilla, because he tried to make modern anime out of Godzilla and that's a problem. Now that we know who Onno is, we can discuss what Evangelion does better than Shin Godzilla. Evangelion's music is composed by Meth Head Shiro Sogi Su. NGE has a variety of songs ranging from jazz to orchestral, drums, and salsa. The intro and outro songs are incredible. A Krill Angel's thesis gets up pumped up and is spicy. Fly Me to the Moon is an actual song by Frank Sinatra, and it fits the character A perfectly. Soggy Su also composed music for Shin Godzilla. But all of his talent is non-present. Shin Godzilla's soundtrack rips off Phil Collins' soundtrack for Disney's Tarzan. Tarzan's got good music, but there's too much talking. Likewise, there is too much talking in Shin Godzilla's music. 
It also rips off Akira, if few Kube's music for the show are Godzilla movies. And it constantly rehashes the Evangelion song Decisive Battle, the one with the drums. The music just doesn't fit the scene it's stapled onto. For example, Persecution of the Masses is a good song, but it plays during Godzilla's first hippity hoppity attack while the humans read the Japanese constitution. How do people think this is better than the Monsterverse? Don't know. We will be looking at the characters for each intellectual property by comparing them, because nearly every main character in Evangelion has an analog in Shin Godzilla. Not a copy, but one that plays their role in the story. If they were copies, they would be as well written, but not in this case. And I had to look up Shin Godzilla's characters' names on tvtropes.org, that's how forgettable and uninteresting they are. Starting with our two human leads, let's look at Shinji Akari first. I know I know nobody likes Shinji, but here's the thing, every negative thing I've ever heard, said about Shinji always comes back around to his timidness, but that's how he is at first. I have yet to hear anyone say something bad about the way Shinji is written, because Shinji is written expertly. As a child his family was hit by an angelic tragedy which resulted in him losing his mother and arguably his father, making him grow up timid, because he had nothing to stabilize him, and build confidence in himself. It's cause and effect you idiots. Over the course of Evangelion, he grows from timid and selfish to assertive, and caring and cooperative. Assertive in coming out of his shell, and exercising his own autonomy, caring for another's well-being which will make others treat him well, which is respect, and cooperative as he has to work with different kinds of people from emotionally withdrawn to high-minded. Of course Shinji makes mistakes but corrects them. In the show, he is supported by blessed babes, those being Rei, Oscar, and Misato. He's also supported by an angelic homo, that being Kawaru. Again he's often criticized by otaku circles, and retarded anitubers for being milk toast, but that's the point of his character. It's his flaw. Since the majority of characters are composed of a want and a need, Shinji's want is isolation, but his need is to man up, which he does. Bennett White said in his awful take on Dot Hacksine that Shinji inspired anime series with timid protagonists of the early 2000s in what quote most anime historians unquote call the Shinji era, but I google searched Shinji era and I can't find it. Then again Bennett the Sage has questionable takes on Grave of the Fireflies, and Akira as well as End of Evangelion, and he is what I like to call a massive faggot. That just about covers it for Shinji, now let's look at Rondo Yaguchi from Shin Godzilla. He doesn't change as a character, because he is a tool for the Japanese government. He wants to defeat Godzilla, but he doesn't have a character need. When Godzilla appears in the beginning, Rondo suspects a sea monster, while everyone thinks he's a beaching whale. Why, don't know. After Godzilla's attack he prays for a family which lost a father, but it was cut from the movie, because Ono is a hack. Why? No idea. He is so devoted to his job and the task of defeating Godzilla, that he lets everything else fall to the wayside including his own hygiene, which is un-Japanese, because Japanese people are supposed to be squeaky clean. He works with women, but they are not supportive babes. Rondo admits to liking politics, because he finds it plain, and simple or straightforward, which is unrealistic and lacks experience. Just look at Barack Obama before, and after being president. Now do you see the difference? I talked more about Shinji than I did about Rondo. That's how badly written he is. How about we go next to the first of the two female characters? Now before you otakus get naked, just know that Rei Ayanami isn't just a master but Tori construct, she is a rounded character. Her color scheme is blue, not just her hair color, and her school uniform, but also blue being a color associated with calm and collectiveness which describes Rei. At the beginning of Evangelion, and at the very end of End of Evangelion, she appears to Shinji as an apparition. This introduces a supernatural aspect to Evangelion, like she is Shinji's guardian angel stepping in and out of time itself. Rei has a surrogate father figure who is also Shinji's father. When Shinji talks smack of him in front of Rei, she slaps him. 
Not only does this show Rei has a high regard for family, she keeps Shinji on track of the bigger picture. The world is turned upside down by angels, and ain't nobody got time for petty family issues. Personally I think, Ray would slap Amanda Winley for roasting Vic Melyonar and his millions of supporters. Even though Ray is like Shinji's personal guide, she has her own issues. Being a clone of Shinji's dead mother, she is permanently infertile. She is for certain asexual, and this makes her emotionally withdrawn from the world. This is a scientific aspect to Evangelion which is traditionally the antithesis of the supernatural. However, this result leads to a naturally platonic relationship she develops, in working with Shinji, and not a sexually active partnership. While also seeing her father figure in him. Nostalgia critic once said friendship, and being in love, are two different things, though that is one of the few things he says which isn't retarded. Moving on, Dairomi Agashira is like Rei, but with all the characterization removed. Dairomi is withdrawn, but she's grumpy all the time. Like really grumpy. Even her actress Makako Ichikawa is a big grump. She would be out grumped by Miana and Mena years later, and that awful trilogy will be punished, I can promise you that. She doesn't engage in any relationship, but we are never shown, or told that she is asexual. We are told she works with Japanese wildlife and the environment, but we don't a single second of screen time of her working outside in the great outdoors. This makes Monik in the monster verse not so gay. She's overall a flat character. We then have the second of the two female characters. Like Rei, Oscar Langley is rounded. Her color scheme is red which is usually contrasted with blue. Her plug suit and Avor are red, and red as a color is associated with being passionate and lively, which defines Oscar perfectly. When she is introduced, her presence lightens up the mood of Evangelion. While her introduction wasn't a surprise, since she was in the intro, her appearance is a welcoming one. When introduced, she is high-minded as she is the top Avor pilot in Germany, but over the course of the series, her pride is behoofed by Shinji bettering himself and outperforming her, which affects her performance. She is humbled which anyone with talent has to expect, and will encounter at some point in their lives. Oscar being on the top of the world makes her think that she's all grown up and ready to be sexually active, but she's still a minor. Thankfully she's turned down by a sane gentleman, that being Ryuji Kaji. He's got class. Oscar calls Shinji stupid which translates to Baka in Japanese. She single-handedly made the word Baka popular in anime since 1995. That's how much of an impact Oscar had on anime and its viewers. Contrast Oscar with Kyoko and Patterson and you'll see a vast difference in character. Kyoko is simped by male audiences on both sides of the Pacific, especially beta males like Sean. Regardless of that, Kyoko doesn't have much of Oscar's flaws, she barely has any flaws. She's not greedy, afraid, stupid, ill-tempered, prideful, obsessive, vengeful, gullible, nothing to work on. She doesn't even look for love and or guidance. All that is on top of the fact she went to Harvard University at the age of 15, and graduated with a doctoral degree and a trail lawyer qualification. This makes her a Mary Sue. How can I relate to someone like her? I'm not, nor have I met perfection, I didn't know it existed, so I don't believe in, or root for this prop. But that's not all, Kyoko can speak English, but it's broken English. English. She has a character goal, she wants to be the first female United States president, but it's a goal, that is irrelevant to the story, and it comes in at the hour and a half mark two hours into the movie. Soto Miishihara deserved to portray a better character than this non-character, and she did. Soto Mi played Hanji in the Attack on Titan movies and she did the part well. I'm not simping her Hanji, I'm giving credit, because she earned it. Now let's look at the head honchos. Gendo Akari being the commander of Nervan Japanese Prime Minister what's his name? In Evangelion's case, the man who abandoned Shinji as a child is the same man who calls him years later, to fight for humanity against the angels, this is the call to action we see in just about every hero's journey. Something that George Lucas understood with Luke Skywalker, something Onno must have taken note of. 
Gendaway is often made the poster child of abusive anime parents by otaku circles, some go as far as to call him the worst father in the history of fathers. While it's true Gendo can look scary in some shots, and the English dub does make him sound more mean than the Japanese dub, he is not the worst anime parent out there. I've seen much worse, and if I were to name any, my blood would boil, and I would want to find them, and smack them in the mouth till their jaw dislocates. In actually, Gendo is negligent. Again he abandoned Shinji after his wife's death, but understandably so, because he had an ultimate goal in mind. In fact, at several points in Evangelion, he's shown to be supportive. In one episode, he compliments Shinji's efforts against an angel. Arguably, he saves Shinji's life in one episode against a Rogavor, because a truly negligent parent would just let their child die. In the following episode, Shinji was going to demolish Nerve Headquarters, while in his Avor, but Gendo stopped him, by increasing the pod's pressure, and knocked him out. By the end of the series, during instrumentality, Gendo appears to Shinji, while trying to find himself, and once Shinji does, and chooses not to be resentful, everyone around Shinji congratulates him, including his father and mother. Evangelion is said to be very complicated, show that's too deep, but in simpler terms, Gendo's ultimate goal is to initiate Third Impact so as to reunite with his dead wife. Third impact being all human beings coming together in one singular cognitive entity. While this is technically genocide, it's not for villainous purposes. And in the complimentary end of Evangelion movie, Gendo does some soul searching, and realizes that he failed to be the father, that he should have been. Before his apparent death, Gendo asks Shinji to forgive him. Contrast Gendo with the Prime Minister and again you'll see a vast difference in character. If we forget for a second, that the Prime Minister laughably looks like Winnie the Pooh, the PM is made a straw man by Onno and Toho to make the Japanese government look incompetent, and gay. A bumbling fool who can't find his own rectum with two hands and a flashlight on a golf course. Like a straw man, he is paper thin. His military strategy falls apart with the slightest amount of scrutiny. The idea is supposedly, that Shin Godzilla is an overwhelming threat that renders Japan powerless. But in the film, it sowed more to the PM's own incompetence, rather than the might of Shin Godzilla which of course he has none of, and I'll get to that later on. In the movie, he is killed off by Godzilla, and situation only improves after the PM and the rest of the old guard are out of the picture. This is more nationalistic than patriotic as the impression is, that this guy's death is for the good of Japan. Disgusting. He's flat, and retarded. The last deep comparison is between the supportive homos. Konoru Norgi Sabu friends Shinji just before the end of NGE, and he is the last of the angels before instrumentality, but he is a crucial part of Shinji's story, because he is a supportive homo. When bathing, Konoru says and I quote it means I love you. Even the English dub got the right. The first one, not the non suflix dub. Ultimately his death by Shinji's hand sends him down a spiral of depression which is the perfect setup for the finale, both the series and end of Evangelion. Hideki Akasaka is the closest to Rando, so is he his gay lover? Don't know. In fact, nothing else comes of him. He is flat. As for the rest of NGE's characters, we have Misoto Court Sir Orgi and Toji Suzuhara. And no Rando is not an analog replacement for Misoto, Blue Nova. Purple is Misoto's hair color as it is her color scheme. Purple is the combination of red and blue, likewise and character wise, Misoto is characterized as being the best of Rei, and Oscar to Shinji at home, Misoto has a pet penguin, and she lets Shinji and Oscar live with her. Like Shinji, Misoto can be described as having daddy issues, but her father was busy with his work, and also he kept her safe when Second Impact was happening. While she's in a relationship with Ryuji Kaji, having someone not as social as Shinji at home has her see her own dad in Shinji Misoto does cool things in the show, but in the show's concept art, she's carrying a gun which she doesn't use in the show, but in the end of Evangelion movie, she uses a gun which is badass. Toji didn't like Shinji at first for collateral damage getting his sister hurt which he takes out his frustration in punching him. 
Eventually, Shinji saves Toji's life and that makes him grow respect, and to repay him, he has Shinji punch him. This story arc serves as a stepping stone in helping Shinji become more assertive, even if the method of payback was aggressive, and by legal definition battery. As for the rest of Shin Godzilla's characters, everyone else on screen is superfluous. Hayao Miyazaki makes a cameo as a background character, but he's an anime industry legend and he deserved better. I didn't expect bad character writing to be an issue for Hideaki on no. Even Blue Nova admits the characterizations are simple, the ballroom meetings are numerous, and to be prepared for an extensive amount of dialogue. But apparently the countless abandoned half-baked, or rushed plot and character threads don't matter. Apparently the cast of characters bloated to the point of preventing character development, and rendering the various romances ineffective don't matter. Apparently it's alright for characters to lose what little character they had to start with in the first act and function as political tools to set up monster action for the rest of the film. The disregard for humanity affects every level, and not to the benefit of the film, am I right? Off screen we have Goro Maki, a scientist who apparently studied Shin Godzilla and committed suicide. Fans speculate that he is the head at the end of Shin Godzilla's tale, but that's all head canon fan stuff. It is not confirmed by Ono or anyone at Toho. Now let's move on to the kaiju. Neon Genesis Evangelion has a variety of kaiju called angels. Some people think the angels have no personalities and just walk forward for no reason. They might not have enough personality to satisfy one's arbitrary standard, but they do have a motivation. Their goal is to infiltrate the base, merge with Lilith, and initiate third impact. Bad faith critics tend to forget that the origin of the angels and their motive is overall inconsequential. Information on where the angels came from is actually in the PlayStation 2 game, rather than the show itself, but it's not required to know, because it is not the focus of the show. On the other side, humanity has the means to fight angels called Avors. If you paid close attention, you would know that Avors are actually angels, and if an Avor reaches the power core of an angel, they become godlike. Which is cool. The Avors will eventually become inspirations for the Jaegers in Pacific Rim and the Titan Shift as an attack on Titan. Shin Godzilla only has Godzilla, but with different forms. Even then those forms don't amount to anything until the quote fourth unquote one. The film says Godzilla has four forms, but we only get to see three on screen. And their names come from fans as the official sources can't come up with them. Lazy. The first form does not apply, because it's off screen. The second form is called Camort or Kune. When the theater program was leaked onto the internet, everyone mocked with form as a rubber chicken and turkeyzilla. D-Man 1954 was triggered by this at first, but then he pretended it's what he wanted from a Godzilla movie. The third form is called Shinago Wakun. Its time on screen is short, but it's mostly remembered for a deleted scene in which he vomited blood. It was cut from the film, because Ono is a hack. The fourth form is most remembered, but has very little originality. The monster design is clearly a regurgitated zombified version of Shodaigoji. But since 1954 and 2016 are 62 years apart, Japanese audiences were ignorant to the fact that Toho was giving them a regurgitated version of an already established Radesin. The fifth form is not Godzilla firing his atomic breath as merchandise would have you think. It is apparently the humanoid creatures peeling off of Shin Godzilla's tail. D-Man supposes this to be a metaphor for humanity being the monster, now that they defeated Shin Godzilla, but he's obviously reading too much into it. Worst of all, this was a missed opportunity, to be a prequel to the Attack on Titan, live action movies, where the humanoid creatures take over the Earth and humanity experiments on themselves pieces of Shin Godzilla, and become man-eating giants resulting in the collapse of civilization. You cowards, Toho. Furthermore, Fans think this the most powerful version of Godzilla. They're right but they're also wrong. Shin Godzilla is basically a glass cannon. He has extremely high offensive power but abysmal defense. Legendary Godzilla would tear Shin Godzilla limb from limb. 
when he spams his atomic beams the first time, he has to go into Bandai figure like dormancy to recharge. But when he does it a second time, he doesn't have to recharge. Inconsistent. Shin Godzilla is more unrealistic than the Monsterverse. Not only does he have no discernible reason to make landfall, he spams his beam out of his back, and the end of his tail. Next you'll be telling me he'll grow wings, and fly or grow a sledgehammer. And apparently his atomic beams and highlights are purple to be a so-called homage to Prince, the gay songwriter and singer who died of AIDS, and would sue a woman filming her baby dancing to Let's Go Crazy. Disgusting. Now let's talk about the meat and potatoes of this comparison, the story. Evan Galleon's story in short is about a young boy becoming a legend. It is episodic in TV series form as it should be. We are thrusted headlong into the midst of the story without any time to adjust or know what we are dealing with or who the characters are, but once we are settled, the screen time is devoted to fleshing out the characters and the world. The plot in some episodes may be convenient at times, there may be some loose ends dangling, but no contradictions or plot holes as far as I know. Evangelion has been dissected so much everyone has taken about 10 million meanings from it, but that's what makes it art. For a show about giant robots punching each other, everyone thought Evangelion was going to end with Shinji and Gendo settling their score in Eivor's in a cliché father versus son battle to see who is the better man, but that doesn't happen. Rather, it ends with an in-depth character study of the main cast led by Shinji, while instrumentality happens elsewhere. In the end, Shinji ends up thinking of alternate realities he can create for himself and others, but ultimately choosing to stop loathing himself, to choose to be alive, to be selfless. Affecting everyone's destiny. And everyone including Gendo, and Yui Akari congratulate him. One alternate reality Shinji made in the show is him and everyone in a anime slice of life setting where they go to high school. That alternate reality is in one of the many many spin-offs, making it canonical. Meaning that any piece of Evangelion be it a different take, or remake is all canonical, because of NGE's ending. Spin-offs such as high school stories and video game adaptations. This also means the end of Evangelion movie is another one of Shinji's alternate realities he made in which instrumentality happens on screen, yet it ends with him and Oscar being the last humans, making him want to go back to the high school one. There are lots of merchandise and marketing as Evangelion is ever so popular in Japan, you can literally live off it. Some include Rei working at a burger joint, but she's supposedly a vegetarian, so it must be one of Shinji's alternate realities. Another is Shave Impact, Gendo receives a shaving kit, a Father's Day gift from Shinji I suppose. The rebuilds were supposedly a commentary on the state of the Japanese audience and the Japanese animation industry as a whole, or just on no retelling the series with a better budget, and reshaping the story, now that his mental health and state changed, or that there really isn't a deeper meaning behind it, and looks better than the old, and it's all just a 1997 Evangelion fan fiction brought to life on the big screen, but they can be seen as Shinji looking back on his journey only embellished. He may have wanted to see Oscar as a tsundere as she is arguably the progenitor of that anime archetype. Etc. Onno is good at writing well-rounded compelling characters and captivating stories, so what in the shitting universe happened with Shin Godzilla? Its story appears to be episodic much like Evangelion, but Shin Godzilla isn't a TV series, it's a movie 26 episodes running 24 minutes is more than enough to flesh out the characters and world, but Shin Godzilla's 2 hour screen time isn't enough. It introduces characters quickly and lazily via text. Subtitles and surtitles. It is a truly clustered movie. This is also, why anime recap movies suck. If the general audience were to watch an anime recap movie, they won't get it, because not only will it be hastily paced, they don't know who the characters are, or what the world is, because it'll be underdeveloped. Cramming it all into two hour movies will result many missing details. But the fans won't mind the characters being paper thin or the pacing being too fast, because they've already connected themselves to the original work, their head cannons are subconsciously filling in what's missing. Likewise, moments of characterization never come in Shin Godzilla and such little come far too late to matter. Furthermore, Shin Godzilla makes use the mystery box. 
you're left to wonder who Goro Maki was, why did he commit suicide, did he release Godzilla onto the world, why did he release Godzilla if so, did he merge himself with Godzilla, is he really the head at the end of Godzilla's tail. In addition you wonder what Shin Godzilla's first form looked like, or what other forms Godzilla would take on had he not turned into a statue. And you even wonder who the characters are on a more personal level and what they do outside of work, maybe that's the reason why the majority of the merchandise and fan art is centered around Shin Godzilla's characters, and other Awa trash like Hiromi and Kayoka being in a lesbian relationship, when there's no evidence to prove it in the film. Something Juju Abrams would have an orgasm over. Disgusting. For the vast majority of people all over the world, politics are gay. But if you're going to make a political thriller, you should at the very least establish who the characters are, and why I should care. On top of that, you have to task of portraying another nation's domestic politics. If you can't pull it off, foreigners will not get it. Americans didn't like Shin Godzilla because it sucked, not because of a dick measuring contest between America and Japan, trusty milkshake you pansy. Political movies that don't suck are as followed. The Star Wars prequels depict the fall of a republic and the rise of an empire, much like the Roman Republic in history. Godzilla 1984 depicts Cold War anxiety induced on Japan by America and the Soviet Union in the face of Godzilla. GMK depicts people wanting to forget their own bloody history being punished for not learning from it, as writer and philosopher George Santayana once said those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Now, if you want to see a Japanese film that pokes fun at government incompetence, while also being entertaining to watch and patriotic, watch Fukushima 50. It succeeds where Shin Godzilla failed, and at least it has Ken Watanabe so in conclusion, Neon Genesis Evangelion is a fun and philosophical mecha series. An introspective work about fighting your inner demons and growing up. It is truly Hideaki on Noah's magnum opus, and is superior to that of the dumpster fire Shin Godzilla. With Shin Godzilla behind him, and the last rebuild movie made, Ondo can now live life as a fulfilled man. And just so we are clear, I'm so sorry Ondo. I'm sorry for what Toho made you do. Just know that, when I criticize you for your part in Shin Godzilla, it's because I love you, and want to see you better yourself. No homo. Right now, like Disney, Toho right now is riding on the ticket of Shin Godzilla and Theo milking it for zenies. Paper Fins once said in his video I believe titled my thoughts on the latest Godzilla movies this past decade, and I believe that's the title, because he's removed that video from YouTube, because he is a piece of backer. He said that Shin Godzilla was a financial success for Toho. It was a huge shit. Toho even tore down their statue of Heisei Godzilla at Takara's Hibiya Chanta, and replaced it with Shin Godzilla. Iconoclasts. And now as a result of Shin Godzilla's undeserved praise and popularity, we have a trilogy of awful anime movies which will be punished real soon, inconsequential anime tie-ins with Psycho Pass, and an Evangelion knockoff, but with trains called Shin Kalyan. Like how is a girl with a gun going to defeat Godzilla? And worst of all we have a mind-numbing anime series. Its day of reckoning will come. People actually think Shin Godzilla is quality, that it was made with some level of good filmmaking, and that it blasted 2014 out of the water, by surpassing its screen time, and returning Godzilla to its true roots in a way, that is new or godlike. It is in fact a horrifying mess and easily one of the worst Godzilla movies in the franchise's history as well as the worst film on no made, because Toho made him make it. How anyone can claim Shin Godzilla is a good movie let alone claim that the Reiwa Rira is any good and not gay is beyond me. You can like Shin Godzilla as much as you want, but it is a disaster. You can still enjoy something that's mediocre or bad, as long as you acknowledge that it's not great. So don't even bother calling Shin Godzilla a masterpiece, because you'll be lying to yourself. The MonsterVerse movies suck and are gay, absolutely, but not as gay as Shin Godzilla. The movie is so rotten in many aspects, that I find it hard to be convinced that pieces of Baka like Matt, Blue Nova, Demand 1954, and all the other people praising it actually find quality within it. Finn. I am not simping for Kayoko. <laughs> I'm the Baka. <laughs>
<laughs> Are but, you uh, serious? Greetings, people of YouTube. In this video, I will be explaining why Godzilla Singular Point is an animated atrocity that is just as gay if not more gay than the anime trilogy, and why people seem to be praising it and not recognizing it for the disaster that it actually is. Now there are some things about Singular Point that I do like, but only a handful of aspects. Those being moments of intelligence, some of the monsters, and some ideas that I think would have made Singular Point better, and not so gay. First we must ask the non-cyclical question. What is the purpose of animation? In theory, animation can do what cannot be done in real life. In animation, you can exaggerate a person's features to make them more recognizable. You can make a person's eyes a certain color, you can make their mouths bigger to expression a variety of emotions, you can shape your characters a certain way and so on. For example, in Disney's Aladdin, each of the characters are shaped differently so as to make them distinct. In Beauty and the Beast, Belle is literally the only person in her village who wears blue which helps her stand out both visually and as a character. Doug Walker said so, but he did say Belle is flat so he's retarded. In Avatar The Last Airbender, you can see Katara and Sokka wearing blue, and having Eskimo skin, and living in a frozen land. Ang on the other hand has Tibetan skin, and wears yellow and orange, and is very expressive. He is an outlier, and this grabs your attention, and makes you want to watch the show. This is where the old saying show don't tell comes from. A picture is literally worth a thousand words. But if you try doing this in real life, you will be called a racist. All of these wonders can work for Japanese animation as well. Unfortunately, Japanese animation has built an awkward dichotomy. You can either let your visuals speak for themselves like the industry legends Heiyo Miyazaki and Koichi Mishino, or you can pester your audience with excessive talking, excessive text on screen, or the worst case scenario, rolling the credits in the foreground, when the story is not even over. For instance, Attack on Titan, seasons 1 and 2 never did this, and they were the best in the series for it, but for some reason seasons 3 and onward have started doing this malpractice and now it sucks. But the worst offender I have ever seen is Violet Evergarden, the so-called best anime of 2018 about a girl with emotional incontinence. I tried to get into it, but the foreground credits obliterated my suspension of disbelief. If the original idea was for Kyoto Animation, to adapt someone's fanfiction, and create the most visually appealing anime to look at, then Hover's idea it was, to not have neither intro, or outro and drag out the credits from the 18 minute mark to the end, needs to learn how to storyboard and be fired. Intros and outros exist for this very reason, so why not use them? Godzilla Singular Point commits all three of these sins, especially the foreground credits one. Other than episode 1's blunder of an ending, the show is just walking and talking for no reason. The just here for Godzilla crowd will surely shree in their autism. However, this is not the fault of Bones or Orange. They are just animation studios, and not the director, or the producer or writer. And this is just the beginning of many woes. The story contains multiple plot lines for its characters. They belong to various factions and their goal seems to be piecing together what might be the end of the world called the Catastrophe, which is caused by Godzilla and other kaiju. The story takes place in 2030. By then the sustainable development goals or global goals would be complete, but the world is in ruin by the end of Singular Point, so it's all a waste of time. Now here's the thing. Multiple plot lines can be done in storytelling. It just takes a lot of effort to write such a story and time and talent to dole it out. The best example being the Lord of the Rings, when the fellowship is broken and all that's left is the two towers and the return of the king. Godzilla singular point fails to deliver this kind of story because there is so much given to the audience within a 13 episode TV series as opposed to a trilogy of 3 hour movies. Each episode of Singular Point is approximately 23 minutes, not excluding intros, and outros, and previews for the next episode. So there's roughly 5 hours to tell your story. While all three Lord of the Rings movies sum up to 9 hours 10 plus for the extended editions, which is twice as long as Singular Point. 
Imagine trying to tell the story of Lord of the Rings in one feature-length movie. It'll suck. And Rings of Power will suck. To make matters worse in short terms, Singular Point is a ripoff of Shin Godzilla. Even Crazy Godzilla fan movies and his television set for a brain can see that. As if that movie wasn't already gay enough, though it is not like The Lion King, is a ripoff of Kimba which was proven wrong by a fur, fag named Adam from Your Movie Sucks. It also rips off King of the Monsters. At this point, it doesn't even qualify as being gay. It's the equivalent of gay being gay. Double gay? I don't know leave me alone. On to the humans. We should start with these two singular defecations. Make a minnow wears glasses, she is obviously a lesbian, she is messy, and has short hair, so she's basically Velma from Scooby Doo. Like Madison when we first see her, in King of the Monsters, May burns her breakfast. For a main character, she's not kawaii like Konata Isumi. When we first meet May, she's interested in fantastical biology, but somewhere down the line she studies paranormal activities because science. Yun Erakawa is young, but has white hair which is meant for old people, but he does so, because it's anime. When we first meet him, he's investigating paranormal activity in a spooky house, but he talks about Brazilian cuisine, when he should be listening for an Indian song. This tells me, that Yun is incompetent. He is retarded. In a fight with Anguirus, he is knocked out, and we hear ringing which means he's suffering traumatically, but the next episode he is fine and dandy. He has thicker plot armor than Mark Russell and Raina Braun, and he's supposed to be the armored titan. Like May, when we first meet Yun, he's interested in paranormal activity, but somewhere down the line he deals with the monsters and their biology because science. We then have Habaru Kato. Is this guy supposed to be Fred from Scooby-Doo? May seems to know him, but their relationship isn't intimate. I suppose he's meant to be the useful idiot with muscle, to compliment Young's puniness and intellect, when it can also compliment May's as well. At the end of the series, he displays Herculean strength when giving Jet Jaguar a boost, when he had trouble lifting a motorcycle. Goro Otiki is a cranky old guy who talks in riddles, and his name may be ripped off from Detective Conan. As for Satomi Kanahara, I think she's supposed to be like Raven from Teen Titans, the good one. Not the puke-inducing toddler one. Raven was serious, so her cracking one-liners was unironically funny, but Satomi doesn't do that. Other than that, she's superfluous and her lip piercing is a hazard. Shuaya Sato seems to be like Levi Ackerman, but the only comparison between them is that they have a bowl cut going on. Him sneaking into facilities without being noticed seems rather contrived. I'm not even going to pronounce this guy's name, but he's basically a Japanese stereotype. He also keeps a singing Godzilla skeleton underground. The skeleton is introduced at the end of episode 1, fridged foremost of the series, and taken out of the basement for the finale. Li Giang is supposedly an anime teacher, but she's not an anime teacher hot like Miss Yamako. She studies what the show calls archetype, but can't figure out its properties, that is until May shows up, and undermines all her years of experience. She dies, but her death is a cut away. At the end of one episode, she supposedly dies, then the next episode has her, and May at a restaurant looking alright, and the episode after that confirms she's dead. So the middle one was basically a flashback. If you hate the cutaways in Godzilla 2014, then you should hate this cutaway too. Michi Ayuki Ishihara was said to have previously studied Godzilla, but he got lost in a digital world, so there's an Izakai element to singular point like Digimon, Dot Hack and its inferior red-headed stepchild Sword Art Online. He also predicted the catastrophe like Homer Simpson did. At the end of the series, he escapes the digital world, and is seen creating Mechagodzilla. Why? Don't know. Is this to set him up as the bad guy for season 2? Don't know. Takahiro K buys the Godzilla skeleton at the end of the series, much like Alan Jonah bought Kevin's head at the end of King of the Monsters. Why? Don't know. Yuki Kanoko is an insert of the Mary Sukayoko and Patterson from Shin Godzilla. Except she has a mole like Kuvira. 
Other than that, even the names are similar. Kanoko. Kayoko. Hum suspicious. We then have Berach by Norbibi. He keeps a monster locked in his basement, so he's basically Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs, except he's not transgender. Now I have a lot to say about Lena Vine. Compared to BB, she looks Indian, based on her skin color and clothing. She isn't seen with a mother, so maybe BB adopted her. Don't know. Truth be told, I like her more than May. She saved Pelops from being taken, and has a better character introduction. Her role in the story is small, but there is a way, to rewrite the story, to give her a larger role. Have her pity Salunga, and help him escape. From there, they can become a traveling duo much like GR and Khan in GVK. Minus the romance. Even the artificial intelligence is our characters. Pelops looks and sounds cute, but he talks too much. He is named, after May's dog she had one time, but nothing else comes of it. He should have taken the form of a doggy droid, but he takes the form of a generic looking droid like R2-D2. As for Jung, he looks like an electrical outlet and he's plugged into Jet Jaguar, to make Jet Jaguar PP. Might have just called him Gonorrhea. Now let's talk about the Kaiju. First we have Godzilla. Unlike Shin Godzilla, he's not the only monster. But like Shin Godzilla, he has different forms, but they are unoriginal and generic looking except for the last one. I don't recall their names being mentioned in the series, but apparently their names were revealed on the Bandai movie monster series toy line which is just lazy. Godzilla is supposedly the harbinger of the catastrophe, but his march theme blares and makes him sound more heroic than a disaster in the making. The first form of Godzilla is a rehash of Titanosaurus. It has no special abilities, it only kills Amanda and the transformation happens off screen. This is overall insulting to Titanosaurus as a character. In Terror of Mecha Godzilla, Titanosaurus is a harmless creature, unless you invade his territory. He gets brainwashed by aliens, to join forces with Mecha Godzilla, and destroy humanity in Godzilla. His brainwashing is undone, but Godzilla shows him no mercy, and blasts him off a cliff. He's a tragic monster. Hashtag Titanosaurus innocent. The second form of Godzilla is a rehash of Varen. His special ability is belching freezing combustible gas. He crystallizes into a cocoon, to transform into the next phase. Like Titanosaurus, Varen is insulted. Varen hasn't been in a movie since Destroy All Monsters in 1969. He and Anguirus were supposed to be in GMK, but they were scrapped in favor of Mothra and Ghidorah for marquee value. Hashtag Varen did nothing wrong. The third form of Godzilla is less of a rehash of Gorosaurus and more, so a plagiarism of fan art. He spawns fleshy tentacles which is hentai. He also generates a storm of red dust like Ghidorah did in the Monsterverse. If you hate the overabundance of particle effects, in King of the Monsters, then you should hate the overabundance of red dust here. As for the plagiarism, there is an artist named Delden Ardent, and Toho has seemingly ripped off his art. Links in the description. It just goes to show, that even Japan is not good at creating new and interesting monsters. The final form of Godzilla is the best. He has the longest tail of any Godzilla to date. He can kill Amanda and a flock of Rodans, but not Jet Jaguar. Why? Don't know. He is supposed to be the singular point that causes the end of the world, but like Shin Godzilla, he has no discernible reason to attack. If he doesn't, then the plot can't happen. In the 1954 movie, Godzilla came ashore to exact revenge and feed. In 1984, he fed on nuclear energy, and was even attracted by the sound of birds. Even in 2014, he came ashore to restore balance. Both Singular Point and Shin Godzilla are not applicable. They have him come ashore because plot. There are many Rodans in the series. The first Rodan we see, has Godzilla-like dorsal fins, flocks of them appear all over the world, and multiple Rodan can merge into one much like Shinomira did in the spin-off graphic novel prequel to 2014. But this iteration of Rodan is clumsy. 
he crashes into a building during his first appearance, making him worse than the monster vs Rodan. When discussing Jet Jaguar, we must return to his development history. Jet Jaguar was the result of monster design campaign in the early 1970s. A number of kids submitted their designs and the winner would have their design featured in Godzilla vs Megalon. The winner was a boy named Masaki Sano and his design was called Red Alone Akea Red R and Akea Jet Alone Akea Race Man. Red Alone was later changed into Jet Jaguar. In singular point, he puts up a good fight against Rodden, Anguirus, the Cumangus, but he grows big against Godzilla for no reason. Toho should at least give Masaki Sano credit, if they are going to use someone else's intellectual property. Anguirus is the best kaiju in singular point. He acts like an animal, he's curious, he constantly grows like Clifford the Big Red Dog, and he has future sight which makes him a formidable opponent. Unfortunately he dies. One of the spikes of his carapace is made into the spearhead of a spear, but in the end, it didn't even matter. This violates Chekhov's gun wherein a setup doesn't pay off. Salunga is more like Gabara than he is Berrigan. In singular point, he's stuck in a hole, and is trying to escape from captivity. His shtick seems to be failing to escape and getting skewered. Just. This is rather insulting to Gabara as a character, because he's supposed to be a bully. In Godzilla's Revenge, him getting thrashed for bullying Manila is satisfying. But if you're not going to write him as a bully, rather a tortured creature, like I said, have Lena help him escape, have them travel the world, and have a moment, where he dies defending Lena from say, a horde of Cunangus, Rodans, or Godzilla. This iteration of Mothra is the worst I have ever seen. It is worse than the Monsterverse and the anime trilogy's iterations. Her role is literally, to be in an anime music video. She appears in only one episode as various moths, and does absolutely nothing. She is utterly superfluous. The other kaiju are also utterly superfluous. Their inclusion is evident of Toho making changes to their so-called Godzilla method, but these iterations are utterly worse than Tristar's take on Godzilla in 1998. And on top of that, they have less screen time than those in the Monsterverse. However, they are aspects of singular point I do like. The intro and outro. They are well animated, Mare looks a lot better than she does in the series. The outro in particular is filled with easter eggs. You've got cameos of various past characters and visual callbacks to the past Godzilla movies, even the Tristar movie which is fair. The animation is fine. Studios Orange and Bones did a fine job and that's considering that Japanese animators are underpaid and overworked. They can use another hospital for animators like B-Train or a friendly work environment like Kyoto Animation. Traditional 2D animation is always a welcome delight, and anyone who says 2D animation is for kids is stupid. The 3D animation is also good. It looks better than Berserk, because nothing can be worse than Berserk. The soundtrack is neat. Kansorida provided a list of good music. The best kaiju fights were Jet Jaguar vs Rodden and Anguirus. The rest were alright, nothing special. That's it by the way. Everything else is trash. If only the story was easier to follow and digest. Too much techno babble just makes it an earful, to listen to like the Tower of Babel. Now here's a hot question. Why are people praising Singular Point? How can pieces of backer like Matt from Monstrosities and Blue Nova find this mind-numbing schlock any good? The answer is it's pretentious. It is attempting to impress by affecting greater importance, talent, culture, than is actually possessed. Basically it is stupidity masquerading as genius. Singular point does make use of actual science, but even if the science were true, the audience is manipulated to think that it's smart, because it's using concepts and terms they've never heard of. It's evoking their interest. People often say, if something is interesting then it's good, but that is not true. Another answer is dissociation. The mental process of disconnecting from one's thoughts, feelings, memories, or sense of identity. 
people may be forgetting that they've sat through techno babble because they've gone through dissociation and regained their grip on reality when an action said scene took place and judging the entire series based on that experience. As you can see, this individual is having an aesthetic experience watching Godzilla and Kong having a monster fight. His senses are operating at their peak. He is engaged in the art and emotionally connected with the monsters as characters. He is fully alive. Meanwhile, SpongeBob is having an anesthetic experience when he's watching the same movie, but there isn't a monster fight happening. His senses are shut off. He is deadened to the world around him, and he might as well zone out and fall asleep. This is what people mean when they say something is boring. The same can be said for children on Ritalin when they're in public school. When facing a tsunami of criticism, defenders of singular point will dole out any deflection they can find. They will parrot non-arguments, like it's anime, or it's Godzilla or Maze My Waifu, or it's new and interesting. In regards to unanswered questions, they'll say that it's season 1, and it's set up for a season 2 which isn't even announced yet. They'll even appeal to you either being hypocritical, by saying you can't take Godzilla seriously, or you being stupid, by saying it's too deep for you to understand, and you just want non-stop monster action and no humans. And I'm just sitting here saying who cares it sucks. Godzilla Singular Point is single-handedly the worst animated Godzilla TV series to date. But there are better animated Godzilla content out there. Even better than the anime trilogy. We have the Hanna-Barbera cartoon from the late 70s. It's corny but it doesn't suck. We then have Godzilla which has both animated and live action scenes, but it's educational like Sesame Street. And finally we have Godzilla the series, the best of the animated Godzilla content. The sequel series to the 1998 film that actually has good character moments like one of the protagonists going back to school and finishing his education. The main protagonist is even better than his vehicular homicidal movie counterpart. There are female characters who are hot like Monique. And Zilla Jr. himself is pretty cool. And there are other anime series out there that blast singular point out of the water. To name a handful, we have the classics like Cowboy Bebop. Several B-train shows like Noir and Madlax which retarded Annie Tuba Jesu Otoku said, are known more for their heart-crushing music way more than their actual writing quality, but I can tell you for certain that their writing quality is vastly superior to that of singular points. Even Avenger is better and that's a show about space gladiators not intended for children. For modern anime shows at the time of singular point, we have other side picnic and wonder egg priority. Attack on Titan Seasons 1 and 2 are even better. And then we have 4 slice of life anime shows called Ichigo Mashimero, Mitsudomo, Mitsuboshi Colors, and Juru Yuri. They're basically about a group of cute girls doing cute things, while living their lives. A retarded weeaboo named Splitting Anime use these 4 as a sample, to prove his crackpot take called 2 dimensional bias in which my anime list uses rate 5 out of 10 shows as 7 out of 10 to make anime look good. A care review bombing. Whether or not this is true or false, we can all agree, that a group of cute girls doing cute things, while living their lives sounds more entertaining to watch than Godzilla singular point. Well that's all I have for you now. Good night. Greetings people of YouTube. In this video, I will explain why the live action Attack on Titan movies are better than the anime Godzilla trilogy which sucks, and are the gayest movies in the Reiwa era. And speaking of which, this video will cap off my coverage of Reiwa Godzilla content. In short, it's all gay. Also, this is going to be my longest video so far. This video contains spoilers, so go away. Other than that I should brace myself, Rapid Attack on Titan fans will come. But first I want to give some acknowledgement. This video is dedicated to Hiruma Miura, the actor for Eren Yeager for the live action movies. In July of 2020, he committed suicide over anxiety issues. Love or hate the live action movies, at least pay your respect. Hashtag the world is overflowing with what you want. Now let us begin. 
we should compare the stories of the live action movies to the anime trilogy. When discussing the story of the live action movies, some ground rules must be laid out. Hajime Isayama did not complete the Attack on Titan manga until 2021. Both movies came out in 2015 which meant that the manga was just about to begin the return to Shiganshin arc. And this means that the manga had just finished wrapping up the retarded uprising arc. Therefore, any criticisms of the movies not being faithful to the source material are inert and irrelevant. The live action movies are split into two parts. Part 1 is a loose adaptation of the fall of Shiganshin Arc and the Battle of Trost Arc, and Part 2, End of the World, is a loose adaptation of the Clash of the Titans Arc and the Return to Shiganshin Arc. Some aspects of the female Titan Arc are included. The Uprising Arc is hinted at but excluded. It was gay in the manga anyway. The source material of Attack on Titan is like the Truman Show with Jim Carrey, with a dash of World War II. For the movies, the story is more post-apocalyptic. In part 1, man-eating titans appear in modern times, so humanity closes itself off in gigantic walls. A colossal titan appears, and breaches the wall letting titans inside. The survivors of the attack join the military and hatch a plan to close the breach. To do this, they must venture into titan territory and fight off any titans they come across. If this doesn't sound like Attack on Titan then there's something wrong with you. For part 2, the movies take liberty in giving detail on how the Titans were created, since that part of the source material was inside Isayama's head and not published yet. The movies say the Titans were created by a virus meant for bioweaponization, but it went out of control and turned the world upside down. A real-world comparison would be the Resident Evil-inspired SARS-CoV-2 pandemic of 2020. The National Institute of Health headed by Anthony Fauci funded gain-of-function research and the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but the coronavirus got out and infected the whole world. Dr. Li Mengyan confirmed the viruses in the lab were made for covert military purposes and that they are not found in nature. When it was time for the manga to provide an explanation, we see that a hallucinogenia latched itself onto a little girl giving her and her descendants titan powers, resulting in conquest and pillaging, politics and power, racism and fascism, nemokinesis and mind control and so on, just like Game of Thrones which Isayama confirmed as a source of inspiration. The story of the movies end with our characters plugging up the hole in the wall and looking out into the world beyond the walls and seeing an ocean. This is also how the return to Shiganshin Arc ended in 2017, so this could have been foreshadowing provided by the movies. There are also advanced technologies in the movies and the source material, a jukebox and a photograph. Isayama even suggested fans should watch the movies so they would know what was coming. The movies have a three-episode mini-series called Attack on Titan Counter-Rockets. They tell the events that take place before our characters venture into Titan territory. The first episode focuses on Hans, or Hanji played by Satomi Ishihara. One of the other episodes focuses on Sasha, both of them are really weird. Even the movie's advocate and total Higuchi shill Titan Goji said they're weird. Now on to the story of the anime trilogy. In short, it rips off a YouTube fan film called Godzilla vs. the Kaiju Killer by Chris Elcherson. Now he's retired, and Minimum Ye has taken over his business. The comparisons between the fan film and the anime trilogy go beyond reasonable coincidence. Humanity flees when Kaiju take over the Earth. Humans and aliens return to a desolate Earth in the not too distant future next Sunday AD. There is no guy named Joel. Miller, nor Joel Schumacher humans and aliens fight, and engage in fighting words, while the monsters fights and the main character is killed by Godzilla. But I wish, that were the only issue. LOL. What was wrong with this trilogy? Well Planet of the Monsters is said to be deep and complex but it's not. Mankind has been driven away from Earth by Godzilla, now they want to come back, Heruo is angry, he wants to kill Godzilla but he doesn't. Teletubbies was deeper than this worm-infested ham. City on the Edge of Battle rehashes the previous story. 
Mankind has been defeated by Godzilla. Now they want to use the Gainer no metal. Heruo is still angry. He wants to kill Godzilla, but he doesn't hashtag rehash. The planet eater is terrible. Shock of all shocks. Mankind prays the gate to summon Ghidorah. Heruo is still angry. He wants to kill Godzilla, but he kills Metphius instead. He then Kame causes himself into Godzilla. What a fiery coffin of a trilogy. The world building is broken. Novel times provide details that fill in the gaps and answer questions confused audience members would have, but not everyone in the world is going to read them. Even so, important details should be in the final product, otherwise your story no longer functions as a story. Toho literally did what Disney did with Star Wars. Except Disney Star Wars can't trick people into buying toys. This needs to be said about the characters. Since the Attack on Titan movies were made in Japan, of course the characters were going to be portrayed by Japanese actors. Therefore, if you complain that everyone looks the same or everyone except Mikasa should be Caucasian, Godzilla 2005, you are a race-bending racist and you should be ashamed. They're supposed to be Europeans. You racist bastard! Contrary to what retarded AniTubers like Anime America and Mushrooms like Paper Fins would say, Eren Yeager is a character who seeks freedom. He dreams of one day leaving the walls. Like his anime and manga counterparts, he gives Mikasa his red scarf to keep her warm. After the attack by the Titans, he joins the military to avenge the lives that were lost and defeat the Titans, suggesting he was looking for stability and purpose not provided to him. Eventually he discovers to be a titan shifter himself courtesy of his father. And Ripiruma Mira. Mikasa Akaman is played by Kiko Mizuhara who is leading actress hot. She is Eren's childhood friend, and keeps his scarf, while under Shikishima's command. She is battle-hardened and experienced since the attack, but she still loves Eren, just like her anime and manga counterparts. She eventually stands up to Shikishima, just as her anime and manga counterparts stand up to Aaron when he turns into a cosmic cunt. Armin Ollett is also Aaron's childhood friend. He isn't strong, but he was sold to me as intelligent and inventive, like he was Donatello from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Armin is the MVP, he's the mastermind behind plugging the breach in the wall. He stands up for Aaron when he's on trial. What a pal. John Kirstein is ambiguously Jewish. Like his counterparts, his douchebaggery gets him into a scuffle with Eren, but he eventually grows to respect him after he saves his life. But unlike his counterparts, he dies, and he's not a majestic stallion. Sasha Brow's portrayed by Nanami Sakura but is actually kawaii linked to her kawaii photo in the description. Like her counterparts, she uses a longbow which is a stealth-like weapon, and she loves to eat. She has a liking for Armin, leading her to shoot Kubel for hurting him, and more so for stomping on an apple. Hans is what Satomi Ishihara would need, after besmirching herself in portraying the Mary Sukayoko in Shin Godzilla. She's a bit strange but means well, which is the point. She's not behaving by normal, societal standards. She doesn't think rationally. Which in a strange paradoxical way makes sense for both her character and the source material's character, to be intrigued by titan biology and weapons she hasn't seen before. She is flawed. Oh no don't tell me that's the problem. Anyway not going down that rabbit hole. In the movie she uses an RPG which is a thunder spear like weapon from the manga. The movies also have original characters. Sanagi, like Armin, is the MVP. He uses an axe against a titan's heel cutting them down, and throws a titan by its finger, all of which is badass. His character motivation is compelling. He fights to give his daughter a better life and keeps the doll she gave him as a reminder of his goal. Unfortunately he dies, but his sacrifice saves his comrades and turns the tide in their favor. F's in the chat. Hiana is also compelling, but more so tragic. She's a widow who joins the military to support her daughter, and desperately wants Eren to father her child. She goes so far as to sexually assault him, thinking it would persuade him, but her sexual immorality leads her to being eaten by a titan so sad. Retarded black guys confuse her for Sasha. 
Why? Don't know. We then have the antagonists. Captain Shikishima Yeager is dashingly portrayed by Hiroki Hasegawa, no homo. Unfortunately, he was the tool rando in Shin Godzilla, but Attack on Titan makes up for it. He saves Mikasa during the attack and trains her to kill Titans, and he makes Eren jealous. This is a better love triangle than the first Godzilla movie. His goal is to dismantle the oppressive government, which makes more sense than the uprising arc, but he abandons his goal to save his brother in the end. He is conceptually a combination of Rainer Braun, Levi Ackerman, and Zeke Yeager. Overall, he's better than Rando and Levi, he has a more meaningful backstory and memorable lines than those tools. Jun Kunimura reprises his role as a major as Kubel, his last role being in Godzilla Final Wars. He's in cahoots with Shikishima, and is calm and collected, but loses his cool before his final transformation. He is defeated, but like Shikishima, he can still be alive. What about the anime trilogy's characters? 1 and D you can have a contest as to who would be the most underdeveloped character, and who would make the worst character decisions. The monsters don't count, since their screen time is indefensible. But someone else should be disqualified, and that's Haruo Sakaki. My Godzilla this character is so utterly void of substance, that he's become the personification of a condensation ring left on a table drenched in Greek yogurt and battery acid. He's an angry idiotic emo teenager, rather than a hot-blooded youth. He is committing an act of terrorism when introduced, but is off the hook because reasons. He's angry at Godzilla for killing his parents like Harry Potter. He's not sympathetic, because any other character would have lost what he did. Whoever said Heruo is a deconstruction of angry shonen protagonist needs to get their brain checked. He's not an angry shonen protagonist, because he doesn't eat a 10,000 plus calorie diet like Goku or Michael Phelps. He doesn't strive to surpass his limits, no rivals like Naruto. He doesn't even complete the hero's journey once or multiple times. How embarrassing is it when a furry like Mark Russell can complete the hero's journey when Heruo can't? Angry shonen protagonists are not always angry, they show a variety of emotions. Heruo doesn't. He's just a big grump. Most important of all, he doesn't fight to protect people he loves like Aaron Yeager. Rather than exercising self-control, he kamekauses himself into Godzilla and leaves his quote-unquote loved ones behind. Neither live action nor manga slash anime Eren Yeager would ever do this. Not even Eren at his endgame. Lol. What else is wrong with the characters? Well Yuko Tani wants to be Heruo's housewife at the start. She calls him senpai, when they aren't even in school, and she's just plain stupid, like really stupid even D-Man admits she's stupid. She's a flat character, and she becomes a metallic vegetable by the end. Martin Lazari is flat. He's supposed to be the smart guy working with tech, but he can only extract a small amount of nano metal from Yuko. He's useless. The only difference between Mainer and Miana is one is men, the other is grumpy. I'm not going to pretend which one is which. Fan art makes them more expressive. Mainer, I think, becomes Heruo's housewife, but is left pregnant. Sat. She sexually assaulted him, and got away with it. They are supposed to be the Shobajin, but they are more flat-chested than Laura and Mole from the Rebirth of Mothra trilogy, flatter than Eileen, and Lynchin from the Monsterverse. Miluelu Galugu is for some strange reason Matt Burkett's personal favorite. His only memorable line is 20,000 years, nanometal, mechagodzilla. And I suppose like Matt, he is retarded. Nano metal can do anything, but it's not used to reactivate Mecha Godzilla for poetically retarded reasons. His resolve is to become one with the gay nano metal, to drive home the message that technology is gay. Met VS is the gayest character in the Godzilla franchise. Brian Cranston and Alan Jonah fall short to this Mech Ultra Boy's gayness. His role in the story is to be Heruo's supportive homo, but with ulterior motives, in unleashing Ghidorah Met Fies dies in Heruo's arms which is gay. He is irrelevant up till the third movie in which he prays the gay, in order to destroy the world. To do so, he gouges out his eye like Odin in Norse mythology over the course of an extended weekend. His name may be based on a gay cat named Mephistopheles. 
the only kaiju in the Attack on Titan movies are the Titans and Titan Shifters. All done with tokusatsu with CGI enhancements. Regular Titans look, can range from derpy, and retarded to creepy. Though they make autistic zombie noises which honestly makes them less scary. The first time I saw a Titan meet a guy in 2015 it gave me the spooks. Like genuine spooks. Contrary to popular belief, baby titans can exist in both movies and source material. Just inject an LD in baby with titan juice and voila. Tokusatsu was the appropriate aesthetic choice given the source material and Toho's track record. This is probably the closest we'll get to a remake of War of the Gargantures. Hafu Japanese Australian White Lion Joseph Tichiro Bizina dismissed the aesthetic calling it 1950s Godzilla movie days and blasphemous, but we can write off his opinion, because he is retarded. Aaron is the rogue attack titan, portrayed through a lightweight rubber suit with red glowing highlights. Shikishima is the armored titan, like Aaron he's a rubber suit, but with purple glowing highlights. Hubel is the colossal titan, a multi-man puppet, what Shin Godzilla was supposed to be, but got scrapped for no reason, and with orange glowing highlights. The highlights would make you think these titans were descended from Shin Godzilla himself, and that would have made the movie not so awful, if it was the prequel to the Attack on Titan movies. At times though, the CGI enhancing can be overdone. The steam and glowing, make the colossal titan look, as if he's all CGI. The kaiju in the anime trilogy, according to Planet Eater, started to appear, whenever a civilization reaches its peak in technology. Planet Earth's peak was 1945 with the atomic bomb, but the monsters started appearing in 1999, 54 years late. Why? Because why to K? Don't know. The big main four are Godzilla, Mecha Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah. They are pilfered in ways rarely accomplished before. The rest are shown in a flashback slash opening credits sequence. Anguirus and Rodan are hard to make out in this Operation Hidorat screen cap. Some choices don't make sense like Auger. Auger is canonically a Godzilla clone, but Godzilla hasn't appeared at this point in the storyline, so where did Auger come from? Don't know. These movies were meant to reel in new audience members, but they'll be confused. Unlike longtime fans, they won't recognize these monsters. More kaiju appear in the novel times like Biolante and Mega Gear S, but they don't count, and make even less sense. Again, Godzilla clones. Godzilla is made into a plant. An irradiated dinosaur-shaped plant. Him being plant-like, would explain why the Earth is covered in plants 20,000 years into the future, but it happened regardless. This change was pointless. On top of that this Godzilla is more ridiculous than the monster vs Godzilla and Shin Godzilla. He has a nose beam like Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, and he has hordes of children, Servum and Godzilla Phileus. His sound design ranges from unique to nothing special. His growls are unique, while his roars are the classic ones only a few pitches lower. That's lazy. In 2014, Legendary made Godzilla 108 meters, so Toho made Shin Godzilla 118 meters to top Legendary. Godzilla Earth is 300 meters, to make sure Toho stays on top, however, being the largest Godzilla begs the question what does he eat to maintain his structure? Nutrients since he's a plant? Don't know. Mecha Godzilla has been falsely advertised. City on the Edge of Battle is a worse ripoff than the Hindi sub bootleg film Jurassic City. There weren't any dinosaurs. Mecha Godzilla was said to be designed like a sea slug, but the design was scrapped in favor of being a literal city in the middle of nowhere, and yet the sea slug design was sold as a toy anyway. There was no story to tell with these monsters. Mothra may not be a taco with wings, but she receives the short end of the stick in this trilogy. Her only appearance is that of a shadow for 11 seconds. Ray Warshall Blue Nova argues that Mothra's element dating back to her first movie are present and emphasized in this trilogy, but those movies are not in the same continuity. He even has the gall, the absolute nerve to reconcile Toho's mistreatment of Mothra with, and I quote, her presence is felt. That is retarded. 
King Ghidorah is portrayed as the interdimensional flying spaghetti monster. His role is to eat other monsters that represent planets. If technology leads to entropy, then Ghidorah should have appeared on Earth in 1999 with a buffet of monsters to eat. He exists, while not existing, makes no sense. Like Mecha Godzilla, his traditional design was cut from the final product, and sold as a toy. To summon him on Earth, you'll need the following, two exists who have the gay, two emeralds, and an angry anchor boy. The themes and ideas of the Attack on Titan movies are consistent with the source material. Standing up to bullies, keep fighting even though it's hard, hope for humanity in the face of despair, and so on. The Godzilla anime trilogy farts on its own themes. Technology is humanity's hubris, and it leads to entropy, ruin, and is gay. But the Hotuwa use technology for hunting, carving, civilization. Is it not their own hubris? Even Amish people deal with hubris in real life. Religion is evil, and is the big gay. But again the Hotua worship Mothra as a deity, that's a religion. Both directors for both sets of movies are cut from the same cloth as chubby Brit Ryan Johnson. Diabetic Shinji Higuchi pulled this, by referencing a critic saying who's the idiot who gave this guy an early release. Nihilist Hiroyuki Seshita told the Associated Press we welcome getting bashed by traditionalists. That proves we succeeded in doing something different. Congratulations you played yourself. The art style in Attack on Titan Part 1 has shots that are filtered much like the Blu-ray release of Godzilla 2014. Part 2 has better lighting and filtering. Though HDD Productions are care Braden Candy better, that disgusting Mexican Muppet. The anime trilogy 3D anime style looks good for all three movies. It looks better than Berserk. This was a stepping stone in 3D anime thanks to Polygon Pictures. Prior, 3D anime was reviled, the technology just wasn't there, and trying to emulate 2D anime in 3D came off as uncanny. Polygon Pictures 3D animation looks convincing. Ajin in particular looks good. Overall, the Attack on Titan movies are not good nor bad. They are just average movies. Hajime Isayama said at the time of the release, that he wanted to understand people's take on the movies, both positive and negative. There was clearly a story to tell, and insights to future of the story of Attack on Titan. The Godzilla anime trilogy had promise. It started out average, and got worse with each installment, like Disney Star Wars. And much like Disney Star Wars, there was no plan or story Toho wanted to tell with this trilogy. Since Attack on Titan's manga is complete, a live action part 3 or 4 would be cool to see. I think the Beast Titan or the Female Titan would be cool, with someone like Naomi Watts as Annie and on Fry as her dad. The movie could adapt the melee and war for Paradise arcs. Maybe touch more on the uprising, arc only less gay. There are even videos on YouTube made by an animator using Mikumiku dance. They have Godzilla fighting Mecha Godzilla, the military, and King Ghidorah the way it could have been done in the trilogy. This anonymous animator, this unsung hero, this hot tsunami Ku fanboy clearly blasted Toho out of the water. Now Seshita can go connect life with himself, while we warn the masses, and stop them from seeing this trilogy, especially on nonce flicks. Toho clearly doesn't have a vision that cock well that's all I have for you now. Good night.